the family of First Baptist Church, Indian Trail, welcomes you. Join with Senior Pastor Dr. Mike Whitson as we present Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Good to see you in the house of the Lord. Would you stand? We welcome all of our guests this morning. Thank you for being with us in worship. Those watching us on live stream, welcome to First Baptist today. Let's sing to the Lion and the Lamb. He's coming on the clouds. Kings and kingdoms will bow. the Lord. Yeah. 
it's all about. Isn't that right, church? I know it's good to be in the house of God today, but it's greater to be what she is because she is saved today. I remember when I got saved, and I'll never forget it, man. Awesome, awesome.
saved us, we're going to home to heaven one day. Would you stand with us? Let's sing together. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions, bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. for a place called heaven and one of these days we're going to get to go amen just because of Jesus a lot of stuff going on in this old world but it's all coming to an end one day when Jesus returns John said in Revelation even so come quickly 
Lord Jesus. Let's sing this together. All of creation, all of the earth, make straight a highway, a path for the Lord. Jesus is coming soon. Call back the sin, wake up the saint, let every nation shout of your faith. Jesus is coming soon. Like a bride waiting for her room, will be a church ready for you. Every heart longing for our King, we see even so. Lord Jesus, come. even so, come. Lord Jesus, come. there will be justice, all will be new. Your name's there, faithful and true. Jesus is
for joining us today for Decision for Life, a ministry of First Baptist Church Indian Trail. We interrupt our broadcast to bring you a special message from our senior pastor, Dr. Mike Whitson. Well, thank you for joining our broadcast again today. Uh, it's really a great pleasure, First Baptist, to be able to come into your home by television and just to share the good news of the Word of God with you on a regular basis. So again, thank you for uh, taking the time just to be a part uh, of the worship experience that we enjoy every week together. Let, let me tell you about a brand new um, opportunity that you may have to worship with First Baptist in your area. In the next few days, we're going to be coming to the Indian land area. Now, we're already in Indian Trail, but we're coming to the Indian land area of South Carolina, one of the fastest growing areas in America. And we're excited to say that on the first Sunday night in September, you'll see the dates and the location on the screen right now. We're gonna be coming uh, there in the evening service at six o'clock every Sunday evening. Now we're not gonna have any morning services down there, so those of you that watch our program on Sunday mornings, you continue to do that. But we're gonna be live the first Sunday night in September and every Sunday night after that. I'll be coming down there to preach a fresh word from God. I'm gonna be bringing some special music with me from time to time that you don't wanna miss. So those of you that don't have a home church already, those of you that are searching uh, for a place to get plugged in and connected and developing some relationships, uh, I invite you, all of you, to come and experience the worship there at Higher Ground Baptist Church in Indian Land, South Carolina. It's going to be the new ministry of First Baptist Church in the Indian Trail, and we're thrilled to be able to come into your area. So write the date down, first Sunday night in September, 6 o'clock. It's at Higher Ground Baptist Church, uh, right there in the middle of one of the fastest growing areas in America. So we look forward to seeing you. Now let's rejoin the broadcast for today. And uh, I hope you enjoy the message that you're about to hear now. And may God really speak to you a fresh entity right out of his word. Um, we are coming down to the conclusion here of this little summer series that we've been in for a little while. And we took a little hiatus from the verse by verse of uh, 1 Timothy, and uh, been asking some questions that demand answers. So today will be the last of those, unless the Lord uh, changes our direction along the way. But uh, it, it's the question of this. Is church membership necessary? Is church membership necessary? The answer is yes, so I'll see you next Sunday, okay? Uh, we're going to hang in here a few more minutes. Um, there was a young believer that was approached by a, a little bit older believer than him and uh, asked him a question. He said, have you, uh, you got hooked up to a good local church somewhere? And the young believer said, no, 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 I, I, I haven't gone to any church. I, I am uh, a part of the invisible church. I, I'm a part of the mystical church. Well, there a few weeks later, they encountered one another again and this young believer had a major financial need in his life. And so the older believer said, uh, well, I, I'm sorry to hear that, uh, but since you are a part of the mystical invisible church, um, then here is some mystical invisible money. And so he handed him nothing. As you read the book of Acts, you quickly discover that there's absolutely no such thing as the invisible church. The church is made up of people. Uh, and these people uh, followed the Lord Jesus Christ uh, at great risk of their life and were willing to shed their blood and die for the cause of Christ. Uh, I brought with me this morning, I, I think is one of the most powerful definitions of a church uh, that I've ever read, and it goes like this. Uh, the church is not an organization made up of programs, systems, and methods dedicated to attracting money, members to itself. It's not buildings, offices, and programs and denominations dedicated for earthly display and self-glorification. 
The church is a living organism, a body which is alive, breathing, feeling, and acting. It's people who have committed themselves to Jesus Christ and are in constant need of healing and restoration. It is people who are committed to one another and to the task of reaching the world with the gospel of Christ. The head of the church is not any one man or any group of men. The head of the church is Christ. He is the true source of all the church is and does, and his glory is to be the objective of the body, both individually and corporately. That is the church. So uh, right off the bat, let's do away with this idea that the church is some mythical, mystical ideology. You understand the church is people. Is church membership necessary? Yes, but you say, well, why? Let me give you a few reasons this morning, some quicker than others, as to why that church membership is a necessity. First of all, uh, church membership is necessary because the church is a distinctive organism. The church is a distinctive organism. She's uniquely different than any other institution on the face of the earth. But let's talk about that uniqueness for a minute, okay? Uh, let, let's think about how distinctive that the church is. Well, it's unique, first of all, because of its founder. The founder of the church is none less than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is uniquely related to the church and we members are uniquely related to him. And church membership is necessary because of the founder. You remember in Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And then in Acts, when that great Pentecostal sermon was preached following the power of the Holy Spirit descending and falling and inhabiting the lives of people. You understand that the church is not an afterthought. That The church was planned by God. The church was not something that was tacked on or added on. God knew and prepared for the church. He's the founder of the church. Second thing, he's the head of the church. This would be my text this morning in Colossians chapter number one. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to turn there with me and look with me, if you will, at verse number 18. Colossians chapter one and verse number 18. The Bible says, and he's the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, he might have preeminence. May I say a word just very quickly about this? Uh, you understand that the head of the church uh, is not the Pope. He, the head of the church is, he, he is not the vicar of Christ down here on earth. The head of the church is Jesus and no one else. He's the founder of the church. He's the head of the church. He's the savior of the church. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5, if you will. Notice verse 23. Ephesians 5, 23. There's a, Paul is drawing a very strong analogy here at this point concerning the church and our relationship to Christ. The Bible says, For the husband is the head of the uh, wife, uh, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of uh, the body. Now, that may shock you. It certainly uh, shocked some in the political world recently, and they isolated some of uh, Mark Harris's sermon and jumped on him, uh, talking about uh, how that he uh, was uh, uh, putting women in an inferior position, and he was preaching from this text, but didn't talk about all of the text. He, you, you understand, that there's a powerful lineup at this point. He's, he's saying that Jesus is the Savior, not of a bunch of ragtag, redneck people that are just going all over the world, beeping about. He's the Savior, the Bible says, of the church, the repository, if you will, of the saved. The church is his by right of creation. The church is his because he purchased the church on Calvary's cross with his own precious 
blood. And, and then the Bible says that not only is he the founder of the church, the head of the church and the savior of the church, he is the husband of the church. Watch verse uh, 24 and following, if you will. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, and here's that verse that created such a stink, um, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And, and, and watch what it says, though. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of the water uh, by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and uh, without blemish. Paul does an amazing thing in this passage. He's drawing an analogy of our relationship to Jesus as a husband is to his wife. Now, if I read the scriptures correctly, and I believe that I am, the Bible says, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. Now, in Paul drawing this analogy, what he is saying here is that when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior, you then become one with Christ. And, and, and listen, you can't say then that you are a part of Jesus and not part of his church. You can't be a part of the groom and not be a part of the bride because the two have become one. Be careful, be careful, be careful when you disrespect uh, Christ's bride by saying, well, I don't want to go down there. They're full of hypocrites and they failed and they let, you got to be very careful because later on, we're going to discover as we get into the word here a little bit this morning, we're going to discover that it's the, pri the bride that Jesus is coming back for. So be very careful. Now, let me give you is church membership necessary? Yes, because of its unique distinctiveness. Second, because of the dynamics of the church that are needed by us that no one else can ever give and provide for us. The dynamics. Let's look a little bit at those dynamics. First of all, it's the togetherness and the fellowship as believers that the church exclusively gives to us as believers that no one else can ever provide for us. Now, you say, preacher, does the Bible give us any kind of scripture passages that prove that we must be a part of a local body of believers in fellowship? Well, I, I, I'm glad you are thinking in those terms. Look with me, if you will, to Acts chapter number nine, if you will. Acts chapter nine. And uh, the background behind it is Paul has uh, given his heart and life to Jesus and the old crowd shunned him. The old crowd, he didn't fit into there anymore. Uh, the old crowd uh, said that he was a traitor in a turncoat and, and, and had rejected them. So he didn't fit into them anymore. And, and so watch what happens now in verse number 26. Uh, watch, what, watch what Paul's doing. And when Saul was come, or Paul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. Well, the first thing that Paul wanted to do when he got to Jerusalem was not pay a deposit down on a rent somewhere. It was not that he wanted to go turn the gas on or, or to hook up the electricity in some new resident. The first thing that he did when he got to Jerusalem, it was that he was going to seek out a place that he could connect with those disciples and be a part of the church. That's the first thing that he wanted to do. I can just tell you numerous times over and over again how that people that are moving into this area and they're full of the Holy Spirit of God and the first thing that they want to do is they want to get connected to a local body of believers. I had a couple come through the guest reception just a couple of weeks ago and, and they said, Pastor, we just moved into the area. First thing that we did was we got on to the internet and we chased down and we tried to find some place that we knew where the Bible was being preached. We want to connect to a local body 
of believers. We've seen people as they have left here and before they would ever agree for a transfer of their job from this city to another city, they wanted to make sure before they said yes to that, that there was a place where they were moving to that they could grow in the Lord and have connectivity with a local body of believers. It's something that you won't find anywhere else that you and I so desperately need. Now, the second uh, dynamic is interdependence. Notice in 1 Corinthians, if you will, chapter 12. 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter number 12, and I want you to see verse 21. 1 Corinthians 12, 21 says this, and the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more, these members of the body, which seem to be more feeble, are necessary. Uh, and those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked, that there should be no schism in the body, but that members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. One member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Paul is talking about an interdependence, an interlocking together. He uses once again the analogy of the body saying that, you know, our body would not be complete uh, without every member of this body functioning together. Uh, we just finished the new building down uh, that's connected up to the Family Life Center, uh, and it's a multi-purpose room. We're going to be using it for everything in the world. Thank you to your generosity. And uh, I, I'd, I'd go by there as that building was being constructed, and, and they'd be laying those bricks. And it's just, you know, I'm, I'm just not not good with my hands and I don't understand a whole lot about construction. And, and I'd stop and I'd watch them as they were li they laying those bricks. And, 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 and you wonder how in the world can that wall of bricks stay up there like that without falling off? What keeps it from just crumbling? What happens when something just comes up and bumps it? Why doesn't the whole wall? You know why? Because of the interdependence and the interconnectivity that every brick is connected to every other brick and there is that mortar that holds them together. That's the picture of the church and that's what he's saying because church membership is necessary for that interdependent. We need each other. And then third, another dynamic that you don't hear much about anymore is for challenging and accountability. We need accountability. We need to be challenged. I learned a long time ago, you don't get what you expect, you get what you inspect. When I went to college at uh, North Greenville, my Bible professor was uh, Dr. Walsh. Uh, he was a piece of work. Um, I remember the very first day of my class. I sat there and all that he talked about was, all right, now you can only miss so many days and still pass. And um, here is the grading scale. And he gave us, well, 100 is 90 to 100. A B is 80 to 90 and, uh, uh, or 85 to 90. And, and so he gave us all of those, you know. If I took the test now, I'd fail. But the second, uh, the second day we were in that class, now, he didn't talk about Bible. That's what the class was for. He didn't talk about the scriptures. He just talked about what the year was going to look like. Well, we come in there and he said, take out a piece of paper and a pen. And he gave a pop quiz on just the introduction. And he happened to do that almost every class period. You ask him why. Billy Walsh, why did you give a test uh, every class like that? He said, well, I know that crowd. I know you boys. Y'all are not going to keep up. So I'm going to hold you accountable. I'm going to make sure you're getting it here and here. And the only way I can do that is to inspect what you 
No. Now I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. Would you do that with me? Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 24. The Bible says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. Now underline and highlight that word provoke. I want to paint a word picture for you, for I can, for just a minute. How many of you have ever been around chickens before? Let me see your hand. You've been around chickens. Uh, we, we had chickens and roosters at my house. I was about that high. And I came around the corner one day of my house. And I evidently scared that rooster or something. Because he put the fear of God in me in about two seconds. He jumped on me and flogged me and spurred me. I still remember it to this day. You ever been spurred by a rooster? You hadn't lived until you've been spurred by a rooster. But, but that word right there, the Bible says provoke. It, it means to spur, not to do harm here, but the Bible says to spur you unto love. And good works. That, that, that's the mission. That's what the local church is for, is this accountability. I am absolutely convinced, and, and you'd, have, you'd be hard-pressed to change my mind, but I am convinced that the reason that a lot of churches are springing up and growing around us uh, that have no thought about church membership whatsoever is because they don't want the accountability. I can get in there and nobody knows whether I'm there or whether I'm not. I can stay gone for a week or two and nobody's going to check on me and nobody's going to call me up. Nobody's going to send me a card saying that they miss me and they are leaving out one of the most important aspects of our walk with God and that is accountability. Now, let, 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 me, let me just say, you, we say, well, preacher, now let me ask you a question. I'd be a Christian... But do you expect me to come to church all the time if I become a Christian? Yes. Yes. How many of you married? Let me see your hand. Let me see. I'm married. I'm married. Well, let, let me ask you. you you'd, you'd say, now, you ask me to marry you. Well, if I marry you, does that mean I have to come home every night? Hmm? You get the point here? So, so we got that dynamic of accountability. I found this little letter. I want you to listen to it. Dear Pastor, you often stress attendance at worship as being very important for a Christian. But I think a person has a right to miss Sunday worship now and then. I think every person ought to be excused for the following reasons and the number of times indicated. Now listen to this. Christmas. Sunday before or after for traveling purposes. New Year, sometimes the party lasts too long. Easter, we have to be away for the holidays. July the 4th, well, that's a national holiday. Now, now count these up as I go along. Labor Day, you need to get away again. Memorial Day, visit family and barbecue together. Spring break, well, the kids need a break. School opens, one last summer fling. <laughs> Look at the empty seats that are around you today. Um, I, I, I've lost my spot. Um, family reunions, mine and wife's. Two Sundays for sleeping late because of Saturday night activities. Deaths in the family, well, they're average to a year. Anniversary, well, we've got to have a second honeymoon. Sickness, one per family member. Business trips, a must. Vacation, three weeks. Bad weather, ice, snow, rain, sometimes just clouds. Um, ball games, six per, per, per season. Unexpected company, well, I can't walk out and just leave them. T time change, spring and fall. Specials on TV like Super Bowl and World Series. Pastor, this leaves two Sundays a year, so you can count on us to be in church on the fourth Sunday in February and the third Sunday in August, unless we're providentially hindered, sincerely faithful church member. <laughs> A fourth dynamic. 
exercising giftedness. Look, look over with me to 1 Peter. Just go toward Revelation a little bit. Uh, 1 Peter chapter number 4, and I want you to see verse 10. 1 Peter 4 and verse 10. As every man hath received the gift, even so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Now, the day that you got saved, the Holy Spirit brought with him to you and gifted you with at least one spiritual gift and releases that inside you to be exercised and used within the confines of the local body of Christ. Now, you say, well, preacher, I, I'm saved, but I don't want to have anything to do with the church. Well, what you really wind up doing then is disobeying what the Word of God has just plainly said is that that spiritual gift that I have given you is to be used for my glory within the body of Christ. I brought with me a little. Uh, I brought me a little chart. I want you to look at the chart with me for just a minute, would you? It, it, it's a chart that kind of identifies the stages that a person goes through in their walk. Notice the first one up there says alienation. That's when you are alienated from God. Your sin has separated you from God. Somebody comes along and they share the gospel and uh, you respond to the gospel and are gloriously saved. That leads to stage two and that is salvation. And then from salvation, in the study of the word of God and in prayer, there becomes a maturation process that you move from just being saved to a maturing disciple of the Lord. And that maturity then leads you into an incorporation where you then join the local body of believers and you begin to use that spiritual gift for the glory of God. You're incorporated into the body of Christ and then you become not just a consumer, but a contributor, participating with others in the body of Christ to ensure that this process is a continual process within the body of Christ so that you start reaching those that are alienated so they themselves can be saved, so they can mature and become a faithful disciple of the Lord incorporated into the body of Christ and participating with you in serving the Lord. Now I want you to look at that chart and I want you to ask yourself a question. Where am I on that chart? Are you alienated from God? Are you, has your sin still separated you from God? Have you been saved? Well, since you have been saved, I want to ask you, have you grown in the Lord any? Where are you on that chart? Why be a member? Because of the distinctiveness of the church and because of the dynamics of the church. Number three, we have a duty. I'm not going to belabor this. Don't have time to, to do a whole lot of this. You'll have to get the, the CD a little bit later or, or hear it uh, on a podcast or however because I don't have time. To, I will at 11. Pray, pray for those at 11 o'clock so that they can have lunch. <laughs> but, but you understand the duty of the church is laid out for us in Matthew chapter 28. Go. Go. Make disciples. We're not just to come and be a bunch of consumers in the body of Christ. We are to be a going and telling congregation. And by the way, that is the great commission. It is not the great suggestion. We are to go into all of the world. In Acts chapter 1 and verse number 8, the Bible says, you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and into the uttermost part of the world we are to go. The Bible makes it very clear that this is to be done inside the church. Let me give you number four. Because the church has a destiny. Not only do we have a duty, we have a destiny. John 14 in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, 
I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there ye may be also. I'll come again. Douglas MacArthur, when he left the great people of the Philippines after the war, he said to the people, I'll be back. I will return. He kept his promise. Jesus said the same thing. I'm coming back to gather up his church. In Hebrews chapter 9, 28, the Bible says he will appear not to bear sin, but to save those who are eagerly awaiting him. In a little while, I'm going to be using 1 Thessalonians 4 this afternoon. And the Bible is so wonderfully encouraging to us. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. What words? The words that really say, Jesus is coming back. Who's he coming back for? He's coming back for the church. Who is the church? It's his bride. He's coming back. Why is church membership necessary? Well, it's necessary because it's the bride of Christ. By the way, can I just say to you that the last warning that anyone will ever be given before Jesus comes back is that trumpet? And may I say to you, when that trumpet sounds, it's going to be too late. Noah preached 120 years. Y'all better get ready. Y'all better get ready. It's coming. They laughed at him. They made fun of him. They mocked him. They scorned him. They ridiculed him. Oh, Frank, when that water started rising, Noah and his family got on board, and the Bible says, and God shut the door. I suspect Noah could have been a very wealthy man just by letting some people on board from time to time, but God shut the door. God shut the door. When Jesus comes back for his bride, the church, it'll be too late to make any preparations. You need to be ready now. Would you stand with me and let's pray together. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.